I've made it clear, I made it clear when I was running that my administration's policy would be to support unions organizing and the right to collectively bargain. I'm keeping that promise. There should be no intimidation, no coercion, no threats, no anti-union propaganda. That was President Biden last night in a surprisingly explicit message of support for labor unions, the idea of unions, and his timing is what's key. While Biden didn't actually name Amazon, there's no doubt his video speaks to the heated unionization battle at Amazon's facility in Bessemer, Alabama, just outside of Birmingham. Biden's video was met with a lot of praise, people saying it was more than Obama ever did, the strongest pro-union statement by a president since FDR, the most important piece of political news yesterday, and more. So what exactly is happening down south that prompted Biden to weigh in? Well, in Bessemer, almost 6,000 Amazon workers are in the process of voting on whether to join the retail, wholesale and department store union. It's the biggest union push in Amazon's history. And if passed in a conservative anti-union state like Alabama, a state that is only non-union, a state that has the only non-unionized Mercedes-Benz plant in the world, it could set off a chain reaction in more pro-worker states like California or New York. 2,000 Amazon employees expressed support for this move back in December. So if the vote set to end on March 29th passes, it'll make this the first Amazon warehouse union in the nation. But even at this time of heightened criticism towards one of the biggest, most profitable companies of all time over its questionable labor practices, it won't be easy. Unionizing is one of the most historically contentious political battlegrounds in the United States. Republicans have generally been pro-business, anti-union. And Democrats, well, they've usually been supported by labor unions. But going all the way back to Jimmy Carter even, the party has pretty much failed to pass any major laws boosting uh, unions or union membership. It's why unions maybe didn't come out in droves to support Joe Biden in early 2020 during the primaries. And why they're wary he might just be talking the talk. As it stands, 27 states in the US have passed right-to-work laws restricting what unions are able to negotiate. But this latest push to unionize in Alabama might have a chance. Alabama has the highest percentage of unionized workers in the South, and the campaign there has been echoing issues of racial inequality. That matters, especially when, as union leaders point out, 85% of Amazon's workforce in Bessemer is black. And this effort is about tackling systemic racism that's led to economic disparities. Maybe that's how Biden sees it too. He's made addressing racial inequity and civil rights issues a key focus for his new administration. And let's not forget his first campaign rally in Pittsburgh back in 2019. By the way, I make no apologies. I am a union man, period. So, was last night's video a sign that Biden might be trying to become the most pro-worker, pro-labor president we've seen in this country since FDR? Or are his actions going to speak louder than his words? Joining me to discuss all of this is Chris Smalls, an outspoken former Amazon employee who's now founder of the Congress of Essential Workers Organization, and Sarah Nelson, the president of the Association of Flight Attendants, CWA Union, who's been hailed as one of the leaders in the pro-labor movement in this country. Thank you both for joining me tonight. Chris, let me start with you. What did you make of Biden's message last night when you saw it for the first time? Oh, uh, yes. Um, it was exciting to see. You know, um, I was happy to hear the president um, you know, addressing the vote is probably the most important vote since the 1930s. So uh, I give him that, you know, once again, um, we haven't seen this in the president in a very long time. And I think it's definitely going to resonate with the workers of Alabama and hopefully galvanize other workers all across the nation. So it was very good to see that the president addressing this. And Chris, this... And Chris, this Amazon story is, of course, very close to you personally. Last year, you were fired shortly after you helped organize a strike at the Amazon warehouse in Staten Island uh, over a lack of protective gear and hazard pay for employees during this pandemic. After you gained media attention, it was revealed that in a meeting, Amazon executives called you, quote, not smart or articulate, and other various comments. You've since filed a class action lawsuit against them. What does this current campaign in relation to Amazon mean to you personally? It means a lot. You know, it means that uh, working class people don't have a voice. Um, we didn't have a voice, uh, so to speak, last year as well during the pandemic. So that's what forced me to do what I did. 
And um, that's why I continue to support what we're doing now, even though I'm no longer employed with the company. I was just down there in Alabama with the workers of Bessemer and with the union as well, supporting them on the ground, letting them know I still stand in solidarity, um, letting them know that the working class people deserve a voice in the White House as well. And once again, that this most this this union vote is so important to the rest of us uh, that are unprotected. Unions have been diminished in this country for a very long time. And it's time that we we now get some power back in our hands and also have a voice in the White House. So once again, I stand in solidarity ever since I was fired 11 months ago. And Sarah, you were also pleased with Biden's message last night. You wrote on Twitter, this is Joe Biden saying what he believes. It's Joe Biden being himself, being real. Uh, but what would you say to people who say, well, it's not enough to just say you support unions. Um, what about the actual legislation? What about the political agenda? Has he put that forward to an extent that you support or, or are pleased with? Well, first of all, Nitty, I just want to say that I am super excited to be here with Chris Smalls. Uh, I am so proud of the stand that you took, and this is super exciting for me tonight. But uh, that really goes to what uh, President Biden said. He put this in the hands of the workers. He, I would call him the organizer in chief, because he didn't put the, make this about the company. He didn't even mention Amazon. What he said to working people across the country is that you have a right. You have a right that no one can take from you. If we look at recent elections, like the Boeing election in South Carolina and Nikki Haley bragging that she's a union buster, she was bragging that she was willing to take away people's rights. What the president said last night is that I can't tell you what to do. All I can tell you is that you have a right that no one can interfere with. That is giving people power. We know in organizing campaigns, that is the most important thing that you need to give to workers. You need to give them the ability to understand that they can expect more, that they can expect their employer to meet them at the table and to take their concerns seriously, and also to pay them and give them proper respect on the job because they are the ones who are creating all the value for the company. That's what was in the president's message yeah. last night. That's why I'm excited about it. And that's why I think it's gonna matter in Bessemer and going forward. It's going to matter in policy because people are going to expect that labor policy to improve. So his platform has a better chance of succeeding yes. when you engage the workers in that way. Yes, very well put there. Uh, Chris, in this Amazon case, I think the estimate said about 2,000 employees supported the effort back in December, but the warehouse has almost 6,000 workers. And as many on the right, and even Amazon themselves are arguing, some of those 6,000 might not want to pay or can't afford to pay union fees in the hundreds of dollars. What do you say to people who offer that as an argument against unionization? Well, I can tell you from my experience when I was down there, there's a lot of misinformation now uh, being put out to these workers. Uh, they're being subjected to four classes a day um, that's just full of union busting lies. They're telling them that uh, if they sign up for this union, that they're gonna go on an immediate strike and lose months and months of pay. They're telling them that they're gonna pay $500 in union dues, uh, but they're not really telling them that that's what the annual cost if you add it all up together for 12 months. So it's really like about 13 to $15 a month is nothing. Um, so there's a lot of misinformation. I try to tell them the facts. And I just say, once again, my story resonates with them as well. Uh, with other workers I brought down there that have been terminated by the company or lost their job during the pandemic, those connections right there uh, really resonated with those workers. And we continue to express that even yeah. online, fortunately, um, until the day is done. You know, we have to continue to have these conversations until the yes. last day. Well, we appreciate you having the conversation with us tonight. Christian Smalls, thank you so much for your time. Uh, Sarah Nelson, please do stick around. I want to get your thoughts on this next story. Uh, as the COVID relief package heads to the Senate, it appears the $15 minimum wage plan won't be going with it. The parliamentarian in the Senate ruled Friday that the wage increase could not be included because of limits that are part of the budget reconciliation. It's a huge defeat for House progressives and Senate progressives who wanted it in there and for Democrats who campaigned on a $15 federal minimum wage during the 2020 election. Bernie Sanders proposed a plan B, penalizing large corporations who refused to pay their workers at least $15 by withholding tax breaks. But late last night, Senate Democrats abandoned that plan too. 
So is there a plan C? Today, Congressman Ro Khanna joined 22 of his colleagues in sending a letter to the White House urging them to overrule the parliamentarian's decision. Last night, I spoke with Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and she says, listen, there's only two options. I do believe that we should override the parliamentarian. Um, I think that this is a matter of, of course, and that our, our constituents and people across this country put Democrats in power to, among many other things, establish a $15 minimum wage. We have a responsibility to do that. I do not believe that uh, uh, you know the, parliamentar uh, the parliamentarian's ruling should be really an obstacle to that. And I don't believe that we should be um, really tied up about this because our two options are realistically this, override the parliamentarian or eliminate the filibuster. Those are the only two paths that we have in order to actually create substantive change in the United States. Sarah Nelson, you heard her there. AOC says there are only two options. Override the parliamentarian's decision to exclude the minimum wage hike or eliminate the filibuster. Where do you stand on this? Well, where I stand is where we were talking about just a few minutes ago. We have to build the political will and political power in this country in order to get these things done. So it's not just about electing that slim margin of Democrats. It's about holding all of our representatives accountable. And if we grow the union movement in this country, if we give more workers a voice, we are not going to be writing off those Republican votes. We're going to be able to hold those people accountable. And that's what we have to be working on. So while I understand this moment and I agree with what AOC is saying there, I think that we have to look at this and we have to recognize that we are not giving up on this. $15 is the compromise, okay? We're way beyond that now. Yes. It should be way more than that now. And so we have to keep building the political will to get it done. If you override the parliamentarian, are the votes there to get it done? That's not so certain either, is it? So we need to keep build, building the power holding all of our elected representatives accountable, not writing anyone off and giving them a pass. Republicans are going to have to answer for this too, and they are up for election in 2022 too. Every single one of them voted against it in the House. They have to be held to account for that. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.